high signal arms societies. Today's very timely topic on cybersecurity for nuclear energy. Sorry for it's warm in here today, but take it away. No, thank you, Carl. Okay, so, uh, so I'm going to talk today about cybersecurity in nuclear power plants. And uh, uh, some people might think that cybersecurity is an oxymoron, maybe it should be cyber terrorism or some such thing. But in any case, uh, it, it is a timely topic, in, not only in the nuclear field, but in, in many fields where uh, computers are used and to help uh, guide things and figure things out for us in life. Uh, so um, as abundantly clear from the introduction, I'm, I'm in the nuclear business and uh, at, at Brookhaven Lab. And uh, uh, we decided, my colleague and I, uh, Athi uh, Baruta Masene, uh, uh, to put a proposal into DOE last year, uh, about a year ago now, more than a year ago, uh, on this very <coughs> subject. And uh, he, he's a uh, early in career scientist, so this is a uh, what's called a NEAT project, Nuclear Energy Enabling Technology Project, part of the types of things DOE does. Some of you might be more familiar with the NEUP program, the University of NEUP programs, uh, projects. So this is a three-year project, and, and uh, Afi is the uh, is the PI on it. Uh, he, he does most of the work, and I can try to help guide him along and then do it with words of encouragement and so forth. And uh, so we're about a year into it, and uh, so I subtitle this some preliminary thoughts on the topic because we, we don't have all the answers by, by far on this, and, and uh, I think it's going to take a long, long time. Uh, to uh, penetrate this topic, so any of you who are looking for a thesis area or an area worthy of, of trying to make a dent, this is a really a, a fertile area to uh, help solve some very difficult problems. I'll try to give you an idea today of what some of these difficult problems are. So this is just a brief outline. I'll talk to you about the uh, objectives of our program, what the cyber threat is from our point of view, what the impacts of those threats are, uh, what events have actually occurred, I'll rattle through a few of them uh, a little bit, uh, what the challenges are both uh, technically and institutionally uh, in this area, approaches to evaluating these things. We, we're, we're approaching it from the point of view of an analyst, where I'm an analyst and Auntie's an analyst and we, we like to try to solve problems analytically. So we're approaching it from that point of view. And uh, we'll uh, talk about ways, based on some very preliminary work that we've done, uh, how, how one might protect against cyber threats, and then uh, summarize and give you an idea of what our next steps are. So the objective, oh, by the way, uh, feel free to raise your hand, ask a question in the middle or in the beginning, or, you know, what's that acronym, or, or what do you really mean by that? Or, uh, so, that's fair game to ask the questions while it's going on. So, uh, so the research, the idea of the research is to develop a methodology to assess the impact of uh, cyber attacks uh, on the safety, the reliability, and the availability of nuclear power plants. Safety, you're familiar with that. You don't want to have bad things happen as a result of operating the plants. The reliability, you want the plant to be able to uh, operate reliably and, and also be available for a large portion of its operating cycle. We don't want it to be down from because of cyber attacks. So the essential, the essence of the proposal uh, is uh, for us to, uh, demonstrate, to develop and demonstrate a methodology uh, for, we, we did, this is what we decided to do, we'll look at what's called a generation three plan. Uh, people I think know what meant by a generation three plant. Yes, no. Do I see yeses or noes? Or should I say something about generation three back there? No. no. So it's okay not to know what it is. <coughs> so the, the plants we have in the United States right now are termed, we have about 100 plants in the United States that regarded generally as generation two. Generation one were the initial plants that were developed in the 1960s. Generation three are the plants that are just well, being re, re, uh, evolved from the generation two plants and uh, uh, some of them are now actually being built and starting to be operated in various parts of the world, four of them in the United States right now. 
So we thought that that would be a good area for us to uh, do our research in, Generation 3, things are, because they're kind of not completely in the design phase, but not completely in the totally operational phase either. So we, we uh, got together with a, one of the vendors of the Generation 3 plants, one of the big vendors, don't say who it is, but uh, uh, when we signed a non-disclosure agreement to uh, share it, for them to share information with us, not that we, we have it, right? We, we have, um, so you can guess, <laughs> you can guess, I, I, won't, I won't answer that. But, uh, uh, so, uh, it's basically to help us understand their systems better in more detail, and also from their point of view, to uh, derive any of the benefits from insights from what we're doing to help make their systems even better, safer, more available, et cetera. So the, uh, the demonstration, uh, the purpose of the demonstration is to illustrate the, the applicability of the methodology, uh, uh, particularly because uh, the newer plants rely more and more, ever, ever more so, on digital instrumentation and control. In, in the old days, in Generation 2 and Generation 2, it's less of the modern, obviously, digital instrumentation and control. The world has evolved and moved away from the old, the old-fashioned way of doing business. And so now, this in a sense is part of the challenge because we have more complex instrumentation control digitally, uh, uh, controlled systems. We there's the opportunities for malevolent acts connected with them, and, and this is what cyber security is all about in a sense. So the threat. Uh, Threat is recognized by various organizations, in particular in the United States, uh, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission has, has put a, a fine point on it by saying that each licensee, any, anyone coming in uh, for a new plant or, or for that matter for their current plants will provide high assurance that the digital computer and communication systems and the networks are adequately protected against cyber attacks. And this is in what's called, as you see down there, the acronym CFR, that's the Code of Federal Regulation. So it's pretty serious stuff. And uh, the electric, on the other side of the house, we have in the United States, what's called the Electric Power Research Institute. And they uh, help to enable the development of nuclear power in the United States and support the work being done by industry. And that they, they themselves say that cybersecurity is a new and escalating domain that requires deliberate technical solutions to manage both the costs and the labor demands that would be uh, uh, come about because of these uh, challenges. And, uh, and we need uh, technical guidance on, on how to inform utilities and others on how to uh, implement uh, good uh, cybersecurity practices. Another interesting, uh, and I've kind of drawn this one a bit, you'll see in a few more view graphs, there was a study done by the Chatham House in, in the UK. Uh, it was, the report came out in uh, 2015, October, almost a year ago. And th this organization is, a, is an independent think tank outside of the UK government, but uh, many of the people in the organization are former UK uh, uh, officials, and uh, they uh, the result of their report was that they recognized the risk of a serious cyber attack on, on the civil nuclear infrastructure, and uh, there's a big concern here. And uh, the concern is that uh, digital systems and you have uh, the use of commercial off-the-shelf software uh, can create problems. So, so that was a major part of their message. So let's look at what the impacts are of uh, of having uh, a cyber attack on a plant. Well, it, I've divided them into two columns. One is uh, plant damage. Or one, obviously, one of the things you're concerned about is that so, somehow something, somebody plants a bug, or in a sense, in the plant, and it, it causes the plant to malfunction in some way that creates some physical damage. And uh, so there may be damage uh, with no radiological effects. On the other hand, in, in the second column, the plant damage might have some attendant radiological effects. So it becomes sort of like an accident, uh, the effects of an accident at least, and, and 
so there's some uh, overpower or cooling event and, and then race, uh, release of radiation. So uh, if there's no radiological uh, effects, you still have to worry about on-site property damage. So you're messing up the system in some way, pumps, valves, or whatever, or electronic systems themselves are damaged. So that's your on-site property damage. That implies uh, economic losses you right right to get go um, you have to replace it. Uh, the other the other one is uh, unavailability of your plant. You cannot sell power, electric power while the plant is down. If you damage it in such a way that it's not operating, uh, so that also implies an economic loss. And uh, lastly, and, and very importantly, public confidence in what you're doing uh, would be eroded certainly make the headlines. Uh, so in the, uh, in the second column, of course, if there are radiological uh, effects, then all of these things still apply from the first column. But now you could possibly have on-site and, and possibly off-site radiological health effects to worry about and off-site property damage. So you have a range of, uh, of outcomes, um, undesirable outcomes. And you need to uh, see where, where you're going to focus. Maybe you're going to focus on everything. And what we're doing uh, with, the, with our uh, uh, vendor partner is uh, focusing on both. Because obviously, if you're an owner operator of a plant, you're, you're, even if you don't uh, create any health effects, you're still worried about your, your own uh, ec the economic viability of, of what you have. People could go in and mess your thing up, it doesn't create uh, challenges uh, to the public in terms of health and safety, but it's still a problem for you. And certainly if you're in the business of designing, operating, selling plants, that's not something that's the situation you be in. So the Chatham House report uh, had some specific findings, and these are, it's not a one size fit all type thing, but this is they, they glean this worldwide from what they observed, and uh, they uh, they say that the belief that all nuclear plants are air gap. What I mean by air gap is uh, you've got a lot of electronics, uh, a lot of digital uh, instrumentation control going on in your plant, and you may be worried about an attack from the outside. The notion of air gap is that there is no communication from the outside to your plant. So that's in, in what's referred to as an air gap. Uh, so they're saying that it's not being isolated from the public. It's not always true. Uh, search engines can readily identify critical infrastructure uh, components in some facilities via installed for other reason, VPN connections. And even when facilities are air gap, the safeguard can be breached by external devices coming in. Someone brings in a, uh, a, a, little bit, a, a little memory stick into the device, and that creates a problem. Uh, specific findings include supply chain vulnerabilities. A, 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 Full facility has various pieces to it coming in from various vendors, and you need to be mindful of the fact that these could be carrying it as their own uh, so called Trojan horses, not necessarily the Trojan horse virus that we talked about in, 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 in cyberspace, but uh, in, in the, the same thing in a, in a more figurative sense that something is built into it that shouldn't be there. Then you have the lack of training combined with communication breakdowns between engineers and security personnel could mean that uh, plant personnel often lack an understanding of key cybersecurity procedures. And this is, and you can see this not only in the cyber area, but in the non-cyber area too. On the one hand, you have the security people, and they, they have their own way of of operating and acting on on, uh, on a problem. And then you have the analysts and engineers, and they might not be from the same ilk. And so you have a, a cultural gap between them, and they, they're not meshing, potentially not meshing well between them, or if they don't see the solution to the problem in the same way. And then uh, lastly, over here, it's a reactive rather than a proactive approach.
approach uh, to cybersecurity can contribute to the possible uh, possibility that nuclear facility might not know that a cyber attack uh, is there until it's already substantially underway. So here's a, a, a Dilbert uh, characterization of the cultural uh, differences. So uh, I guess Dilbert is telling the boss, uh, the Albonian hackers uh, are trying to steal our source code. And the boss says, send our goons to beat them up. So, so loosely speaking, this is supposed to be the, the, the left brain analyst and leader of the, the, the tough guy, maybe the security guy, you know, the, guy, the guns, guards, and gates guys. And not, not that they're bad people, but uh, uh, they have their own way of thinking, a different approach. And so Dilbert says, uh, I was thinking more along the lines of improving data security. And the boss says, well, if you don't fix things, uh, the goons can beat you up. So, so he's working on it. He's, now he's motivated. You know, his, his job's at stake, and they're behind him and, and looking at what they, they think he thinks the firewall's all about. Or such thing. But it kind of captures the sense of uh, that people are not reading from the same page or acting from the same page uh, in terms of, and, and we see this in our everyday lives all the time. There are different people see problems from a different point of view, and uh, each has its benefits and, and its advantages, but sometimes they don't mesh well, and uh, they should all do better. So uh, so what the, Cap the Chatham uh, House report recommend? They develop guidelines for, just very briefly, you can read this faster than I can say, uh, developing guidelines for measuring uh, cybersecurity risks. Uh, again, that's an analytical approach, which would take into account both the security piece and the safety piece that come, in, come into play here. And th those in themselves have been uh, always uh, areas within uh, the nuclear realm uh, that have, uh, we we've tried to do a better job in meshing this. How do we deal with security? How do we deal with safety? Are there push-pull types of features connected with them? Is something you do for security also good for safety or not, and vice versa? Uh, so, this, so it's really a tall order to develop those guidelines. Engaging in a, a robust dialogue, as we just said with the cartoons, uh, between uh, in the engineers uh, to uh, uh, raise awareness of what the issues are from the cybersecurity uh, point of view. You know, this is important stuff, basically, is what it's saying. And then implementing rules uh, uh, of how to do things in a good way, rules of good practice, perhaps, uh, and enforcing them where they uh, do exist. OK, and finally, uh, two other recommendations. Improving disclosure by encouraging anonymous information sharing. People don't feel that their jobs are threatened by saying, hey, you know, this isn't really working right. And then perhaps encouraging universal adoption of regulatory standards. This might uh, suggest that an international organization like, say, the International Atomic Energy Agency. So obviously, we have uh, <coughs> nuclear power plants around the world, and you know, it's not just a issue for one country alone. And uh, you might benefit from understanding how other people are getting insights into approaching uh, these difficult problems. So technical and institutional challenges. Uh, EPRI has kind of uh, hit on it fairly well. They've identified a few uh, technical issues within the nuclear cybersecurity area. Where, and it, it seems like there, there seems to be some consensus here between them and, and uh, some of the other things I just uh, talked about lack, that, lack of effective supply chain and uh, developing uh, methods for managing cybersecurity risk, lack of effective integration of technical and cybersecurity principles, lack of technical spaces for application of controls and methods. Uh, the NRC's so-called Bible on this thing is, is what's called, so if you're any suits here thinking about getting into this area, doing a thesis, you know, you've got to read new reg. Uh, the Red Guide uh, 5.71, which lays out NRC's uh, approach to dealing with uh, cybersecurity. It derives from the code, the, that part of the Code of Federal Regulations, which requires licensees to protect the, the, their digital uh, uh, systems, and uh, in particular to focus on uh, safety related and important to safety functions, security functions, and again, those are 
different things in the plant, different people, different sub-organizations of NRC watch after these, uh, different people at the utilities and then the vendors get involved in these things. So uh, you really need more of a holistic look. Uh, emergency preparedness functions. This is another aspect of all of this. It's not only what's going on in the plant, but it's uh, things going on outside as well because there's information that's going to go trans uh, outside of the plant which may be needed uh, in the case of an accident and how is that information added? and how might it be corrupted. Uh, support systems and equipment which if compromised would adversely impact safety, security, or emergency preparedness. So again, it's looking broadly at all these areas. So a few people have been making some progress or recognizing some of the issues here. Uh, uh, sponsored by APRI, which is a Sandia National Lab study where, uh, on uh, uh, cyber risk. And again, they recognize as a new emerging area. Uh, and they, they, these folks are looking for uh, ways to identify vulnerabilities, what are the threats, it's called threat vectors, what kind of threats would you have? You have to, if you're going to analyze it and study it, you've got to think, well, what, what are the threats that might come about? And uh, what, are, what are the impacts and how, how do you define them? Uh, there are methods and safety called hazards analysis where you kind of identify what your hazards are. Uh, how things might get initiated, uh, but in this area, it, it's a little more challenging to kind of define what what the hazard space looks like. So th their research goal basically is to learn how to best leverage the current methods in safety and security. There's they want good folks at, at San Diego who do this sort of thing uh, to enable uh, the development of a. A robust cybersecurity uh, uh, analysis approach, which uh, in, takes into account what the likely challenges are and what the consequences would be. And just to follow on, another very more specific to probabilistic risk assessment, which has been a uh, an approach used in the safety area for many decades now, since at least since Watch 1400 of the mid 70s. Uh, there have been uh, interest in applying that approach to uh, other areas uh, the security, also non-nuclear areas, the chemical risk uh, to uh, aviation risk with, with uh, uh, aerospace uh, risks to, with uh, certain degrees of success. So the, que the question would naturally arise, are the methodologies and tools laid out in, in that in that area uh, applicable here to cyber uh, threats. So their uh, approach was to uh, look at how one would identify uh, critical digital assets using a, a vulnerability uh, analysis approach coupled with what the consequences are. And they talk about ranking risks in terms of difficulty or probability. And the reason they talk about difficulty or probability and not just probability is because it's very hard to know how likely it is that you're going to have any cyber attack. It's, it's a deliberate event. How do you predict the probability of a deliberate event? Not impossible, but it's difficult. And uh, they, difficulty is it's now a noun with capital D there. And, and they, so more in a sense that they're using difficulty, a, a, a non-numeric, uh, well, it's numeric, but, but uh, uh, non, not necessarily a precise analytical uh, numeric parameter to give a sense of, of relative degrees of difficulty as opposed to trying to actually try to get the probability. So some give, in, in at least saying, well, it's high, medium, or low, or this is more challenging than that. So to look at how to exploit the difficulty, uh, measure the difficulty of attacks, probability of hardware and software failures, and ultimately what the consequences are on a planned function. And then to link the risks uh, with controls to address gaps in detection and prioritizing resources that might be applied to, uh, to uh, uh, improving the situation or mitigating the situation, preventing it. Uh, so here is, as I said, uh, give a few but not all uh, 
uh, cyber attacks that have occurred, reported to have occurred, uh, one was starting with the Nalina plant in Lithuania back in 92. A few in the U.S. Uh, reported that have occurred in the U.S. Then some more recent familiar ones in the Tons facility uh, in Iran and Boucher. And then there was one in an unnamed Russian facility. And the Korean facility, Hydro and Nuclear Power Company facility in 14. And, and just very recently one in Germany. So, and then maybe there are more. Maybe there are some that have happened, were not reported. But these were reported. You know, how? Yes, please. Um, so, in general, who are do they know? Is there any sort of common thing with the actors involved in trying to? Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know who, who the actors are. I think that's some are known. Yeah, some are known. Some are known. Some some are known. Some okay, are yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> some, some are state-supported. Uh, yeah, yeah. Viruses that were right. sent to stop nuclear facilities, yeah, yeah. so we know that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, it, I don't know that there's a theme that's across all of all of these. Yeah. Mostly state support. So, what exactly were they trying to do? Or were they trying to do? Different things in, in each case. And, you know, they, they try to, well, we, the, uh, we, we know about the Natanz facility, but we put such an air, such an virus. Who did it? Why? <coughs> you can, uh, you know, draw your own conclusions or these reported events. Uh, but the the main message is that it it's evidently a, a real thing and it's something to worry about to uh, to address. Okay, so this is uh, so as we're trying to look at our problem now from the point of view of, of analysts, we we. Uh, we, we took a look at what a, a generic industrial system looks like from the point of view of uh, if you're in cyber world. Yes. Um, so FERC uh, has regulatory guidelines for nuclear plant, not nuclear plants, but power plants in general. So how does nuclear differ specifically from, let's say, any a coal plant or natural gas plant in terms of cybersecurity? Oh, distribution system. I'm sorry. Substation. Uh, distribution of electricity as well. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's a, a different. Well, well here, you, you certainly the consequences of, of and its events. The the, uh, the INC systems, I would imagine, are more complex in a nuclear plant. Although I, I would say in a modern uh, coal fired plant or, or oil fired or other, that, that it's not getting more complex with the INC systems. So. So this is a maybe this is the generic the, the way it sits in a generic sense. Uh, so outside you have your so-called enterprise system, which has your your work systems, your your uh, printer servers, uh, wireless devices, and, and so forth. And so that's your outside world. And then you kind of come into the uh, the inside workings of it. And at the top level you have. Uh, they, they call it the supervisory level. You have control servers, uh, main human machine interface systems, data providing system engineering workstations, and then that all trickles down and connects into the, the guts of what's going on in the plant in terms of uh, how it um, drives uh, motors and servers and so forth uh, uh, that um, make, uh, make the thing actually work actuates things and draw your attention to down here is in the words remote access this is where you have the vendor supplied systems coming in as a and I'll, I'll illustrate a little bit more in, in the hypothetical nuclear system that I'll put up next uh, so that is a, a key area of uh, interest so this is a we try to when you try to solve very complicated problems at least it's my style and uh, my colleagues style you start with a simple system, try to understand this, uh, an ideal simple system first, which is what is shown here. So, but here's a, a simplified view of the world of the nuclear power plant control system. So here's, here's the reactor sitting here. Here are signals that come off of it, uh, sensors, you have controllers that control what you're going to do if the transmitter gives you some information and then you actuate something, it might be valves, let's say over here. So 
So then there's, uh, here's your outside world on the far right, which is uh, your site management, uh, wireless uh, access point. And then the communication between that and the internal world is through a firewall, which is, a, is, uh, is designed to be a, uh, a, a one-way transmission system. You can't transmit, trans, uh, transmit into it. You can take information out through a fiber optic system, let's say. But so, so this is your um, man-machine part of, of the world uh, where you have now your, your interface on the man-machine interface or engineering workstations and, and uh, the data historian. But it, you also have the remote vendor access to the, this uh, engineering workstation which can be a, you know, a, an interesting part of it to examine in more detail. So this is... Uh, just a blow up of how the thing might look in, in more detail. This is your, your, your containment, your, your vessel, and uh, this is obviously a pressurized water reactor example. Just showing to illustrate the types of things you might actually try to control. So the human, uh, the human machine interface operating system attack would modify the operating system to display misleading uh, information in the case of an attack. And you have so-called man-in-the-middle modification of input signals into the HMI. So that's the what we'll be playing here. And one of the things we're, we're trying to uh, use as part of our paradigm in, in, our, in our research. Uh, and th this is just a picture of it from a, a safety display system. Uh, I don't expect you to be able to read anything here, but we put this up anyhow, modifications of involved modifications and commands from the HMI to the controllers, supply, supply chain uh, vulnerabilities, uh, both software and hardware. So the programmable uh, logic controller attack surface uh, uh, can involve attacks uh, to the firmware, which of course is the software that controls the PLCs. It can affect calibration and, and data set points pro and uh, that the algorithms you use uh, in, the, in and of themselves uh, in the programs and the controller uh, inputs and outputs. And they're, they're, as I indicated earlier, they're also uh, vulnerable to, susceptible, I should say, to uh, supply chain attacks. And if you look at the engineering workstation uh, attack surface, uh, the uh, the programming of controllers are, are often done from the engineering workstation using vendor some, uh, proprietary software suite. Uh, remote access to engineering uh, workstation uh, uh, can compromise the security of a workstation. Uh, following on with that, removable media used at the workstation can affect it with malware. Engineering workstations usually run uh, Run commodity operating systems, uh, making the knowledge we develop a dedicated malware for more, for a more common. And then infected workstations can transfer malware into the controller during programming. So, thinking about approaches uh, to this, we, we've, uh, we and others, folks at Sandia, probably, uh, well, every supporting Sandia and uh, others around the world, think about, well, are, are there what are what are good approaches to use? So, one approach, uh, since I come from the PRA background and a lot of background in that area, think in terms of the logic tree approach, trying to understand the problem in terms of either breaking it down into its, its more fundamental pieces or evolving uh, uh, from some basic event and then branching out where you have uncertainties. So. You would have to ask yourself, uh, if you're branching out from some basic event, you have to, to do that, you have to figure out what the challenges are, and to say what the challenges are. Yes? So two questions. For the first one, did they run any analysis on, uh, like, the few power plants that you mentioned that were attacked on the, like, what could they have been yeah, Guess what? Your, the noise back here is competing with you. So you have to speak up. So I guess, like, for the first one, when they did some attacks on the power plants, did they ever make a report on what was wrong with it, or if they had certain infrastructure that was behind the firewall, or yeah, I'm sure they, they did. I haven't looked at that in any detail. Lessons learned. Uh, yeah, I'm sure there are lessons learned reports. And maybe there are some. Maybe they're not fully available. 
and do these things also like encounter for like the actual physical hardware failure or like how would you encounter that because I mean it would have some sort of like spot or shut down protocols right in case of I'm emergency. sorry like how would you actually look at the like the physical redundant network or any, yeah. any physical like right. is that is it all just programming or is it like part of it's also looking for physical no it can failure? attack physical systems so, you know, ultimately. right but what about physical failure in general like if your server box or something goes out or like how does it encounter that is there like redundant networks in place for that or oh are you talking about a random failure occurring and then compounded with that. Yeah, so that's an even harder problem. <laughs> Exercise with the system. No, I think you're right. That that's a, an important part of it as well. Oh, because yeah. that that does come with that part. It should. It should. Yeah. Right. Okay. That's yeah. 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 It's uh, that's what makes this whole thing so difficult and challenging. So you could start from the challenges point of view, or you could. Do the inverse. You would say, well, what are the bad outcomes? If you know what your bad outcomes are, that up front, then then you could try to figure out how do you, what does it take to get to what combination of events, so to speak, would get you to those outcomes. Uh, and then you have to ask yourself, is, is it are these safety related events, or are they not safety but still have economic uh, uh, impacts? Maybe they have both. And usually, if it's safety related, it probably will have an economic uh, impact. Uh, another approach is simulation, trying to simulate your system in some way, uh, develop a, a model, of, a very complex model of your system, and, and run those simulations of it to see what the outcomes are. People do this in the safety area, so worked in the, in the years in this area. Another approach, which is more dynamic, is the, a Markov modeling take your system from some in initial working state and, and start working your way down to trans transitional failures to uh, more degraded states to the, to the point where you get to outcomes that are undesirable from your point of view. So uh, it seems like dynamics is likely to be important in this area, uh, time dependent effects. Uh, ultimately what you would need or what you would like to have is a, is a paradigm that will, will yield both insights and some predictive powers and numerical guidelines here help to lead you to uh, understanding the significance of your insights. Yes? Uh, could you potentially do uh, red team, blue team simulations? Yeah. Essentially? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, definitely. Yeah, that, that's a, that, that's one, one way of doing a, a simulation and, and I know the folks at Sandia tend to do a bunch of those types of things. It would make a, a lot of sense. They're challenging, but uh, they yield insights. Yeah. The FPGA people really like to talk about how if you control things with the uh, field programmable gate array, you don't have to deal with all of the um, back doors that you have in operating systems, because FPGAs don't have operating systems. Mm -hmm. uh, can those be, I mean, to what extent can those be worked in? Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I'm not familiar with those, but I'd like to hear more about them. Uh, can I see it here? You know, it, it would be wonderful. The operating systems are, are, are uh, gaping people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so, these approaches and their challenges, uh, the quantitative models, uh, for example, probabilistic models, one, one of the big challenges we have here is, is just basically the lack of data on, uh, on these events. So we don't seem to have a robust or any good database to measure this. I think somebody asked a question a few minutes ago on you know, what, what do we really know about these events and what's the report of how we build up a, a a good database on it. So, so that that's a, a problem. No, no good knowledge of past events. Uh, static models, like uh, attack tree models. I'll give an example of what we've been doing with attack trees in a few minutes. Uh, it, it's it helps to logically decompose a, a failure into uh, or or an attack into its sub constituents, uh, but it may not be able to capture certain dependencies uh, uh, between systems, for example. So it, it could be limited. And it's also static. Uh, uh, 
uh, sequential models, attack graphs where you move forward in time, or Markov models again moving forward in time. The uh, problem with these, if anyone's done things with Markov models, let's say uh, it's not easy to scale up to big systems. It, it gets kind of horrendous. Uh, and, and it gets at least maybe tens or hundreds of components. Uh, and, and the uh, modern systems have tens of thousands. And simulation uh, is basically hard to ensure model fidelity over a uh, full uh, suite of cyber physical systems. So, so we have challenges in each area. It doesn't mean they don't have give. And, you know, lots of students here, a lot of theses, which a lot of these things, insights. <laughs> Good, you know, I have to plug for this. And, but it's, it's everyone's problem. We've got to figure out uh, how, to, how do we, where, where is the give in, in this system? And how do we develop new and important insights? So other technical challenge. One is incorporating the human behavior. This has been a, a big challenge in, the, uh, in just the reactor safety area for the last four or so decades. And uh, how do you do that? Incorporate it in this area. People have to deal with things like fishing and so forth. Um, you know, how would that trip you up, that sort of thing. Uh, the organizational security culture issues that I talked about earlier in the cartoon. Uh, techniques that attackers use in the past may not be indicative of future attacks and new technologies may open new security vulnerability. It's kind of an interesting thing. Uh, and how, how and when do we include system behavior into the analysis, the actual physics that's happening? question related to that earlier too. Uh, and some of these things apply in, in the non-cyber world as well. So here's an example of what we did. We, we've been so far this year working on uh, feasibility of the attack tree that seems to be some uh, value to looking at attack trees. So this is, a, it looks a lot like a fall tree for those of you who've worked with fall trees in the past. And, so you, what you do is, uh, and uh, if, if, you, if you can't see what's in there, it's not that you need to go to the optometrist soon, it's just that the, the printing is very uh, fine, fine, fine. So, so basically we start with the uh, attacker gains control of, of the actuator in some way. So that could happen either because we're a remote command from the human machine interface, or the, the programmable logic uh, controller initiator command caused it. And then you just break this up into things that might have caused that, and uh, you keep resolving this to the point from which you get to some basic events. And then what you do is you, you want to get out of this scenarios. You want to say, aha, what combination of these events caused me problems here? And uh, so these are called cut sets, at least in the uh, PRA arena. Well, cut set. This is a, a set of events that, taken together, uh, give, define a potential scenario. So in this uh, a example scenario, the attacker infects uh, a vendor computer. The vendor logs into the engineering workstation to update the program. A lot of controller programming software doing maintenance. The malware is transferred into the workstation. Engineering workstation is used uh, to program the PLCs, and the malware is transferred there. The malware stays hidden in the PLC until it sets, until it sets that the plant is operating at full power, and then it sets a false signal, going to trip a breaker, let's say. So how to protect. So we did this is, again, just looking at the scenarios that we've looked at so far, and they're very limited. And these really done by hand so far. We haven't put it into a, a big system where, where we start to look at the, the thousands of uh, possible events. So uh, what we've inferred so far is that uh, from this from that stringent cybersecurity controls are important to have, um, access to uh, control policy, incident response plan, Continuous monitoring of network traffic is important. Firewall or unidirectional gateway to isolate critical systems. Judicious use of network segmentation and defense in depth. It's a classic way of protecting having multiple layers of security. So how not to protect. 
another cartoon. Uh, uh, so it's say, they're saying, I'm sure there are better ways to disguise sensitive information, <laughs> but we don't have a big budget. So you know, sometimes you're driven by how, what what you could act, what you could actually do is you're limited in a budget to do because it's not not going to be cheap you know, to do some of these things. So uh, summary and next steps. Uh, well, there's much awareness that there's a problem here, not only in the nuclear arena, but others. Uh, uh, much progress still needs to be made to, in, in the area of just, just in uh, analysis and application. How, how do you do more in prevention? How do you, what do you do in mitigation? What's forward looking? What, what, what is more reactive? Probably should do both. Uh, so um, we're continuing on to explore the attack trees and, and uh, expanding it to look at uh, uh, larger systems. We're also uh, thinking about other other approaches. True, uh, also probably another year down the line, maybe Markov type modeling. So so that's where the story is right now. It's, uh, uh, combination of the two to reduce the combinatorial effect. Maybe going forward in time uh, to certain events that you see along the way, but then look backwards in time at what caused that event. It could help to reduce some of the combinatorial It's been helpful in the safety area. If you just go one way, you get very large trees. When you go the other way, too, it's very, very Having, having worked both in the nuclear weapons complex uh, a little more than the Department of Navy, um, uh, the situation is very different there. Uh, although there's, I think, commonalities to their approach. Um, there, there's huge emphasis on trusted providers of hardware because we know that the, a lot of the stuff, uh, flash memories and so forth, is, is infected at, 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 at the time it's, it's designed and made and over in the usual place of it. Um, but what could be learned from looking at how the DOD protects their operating systems command and control? One thing is for sure is that removable media is absolutely remote. You know, uh, external hard drives, flash drives, anything, disks, and so forth is just not done. Is, is that feasible in the civilian nuclear industry or not? I think it's feasible, uh, personal opinion, uh, to implement, on the other hand, you know, who has the, the uh, well, you have the regulator so they can uh, make you guidance on the, in the right guide. Uh, they, they look at outcomes and events. But, uh, uh, you have uh, more of a command and control. Mind you, that's not perfect. They have their own issues. Right? Yeah, yeah. We can learn from it, you know, in the, in the, in the uh, commercial sector as well. So, kind of two questions. One related to that, which is how do you ensure that you're borrowing from areas that are already having issues with security, you know, financial administrators, right? Um, people who, like the major in the back rooms where security is already a major aspect of it. Right. And the second is how do you ensure that the inner, like, kind of this combination of very, two very technical reviews? power and cybersecurity right. to maintain the focus on simple things like human behavior, which in the end are the trucks of all security yeah. problems, yeah. and not get to some overly technical complicated situation right. that tries to right. engineer that. Right. Yeah, OK, yeah. So I, I think you've just underscored the challenge. Right? It, it, it is difficult because you do have two very complex technologies, and you're just trying to marry them together. And that's what happens when we grow up the digital uh, it, 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 we've done that. We, we brought in um, digital INC. And still trying to learn how to predict the accidental behaviors that occur in that, apart from even having cyber attacks. So that's been a, at least a decade or more long problem. You know, it's just 
get it to the one without it. Yeah, yeah, we did. <laughs> right. So, but your first one, I, part of your question was, had to do with like, interfacing. Uh, well, so I mean, cybersecurity is using the digital world, and it's there with it, to a certain amount of technical defense world. Right. But there is a certain level of experience with cybersecurity in areas like right. yeah. 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 where that is their bread and butter every right. day. That's the right. story of our financial system, where right. they have to deal with the fact that you and I are very right. perfect actors and they need some good yeah. right. how, how do you ensure that the nuclear field is borrowed from them and how do we invent those fields? Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, it behooves people to get to understand better what's done in, the, in those areas and, and also to uh, understand their willingness to share, you know, what, what they learned and, and how they build in redundancies and, and uh, robustness here. Certainly, uh, you know, for example, Wall Street means lots of uninterrupted electricity. So if you can ask for that, you know, I'm sure there, there are ways of making sure it's, it's, it's there. What uh, occurred to me, uh, it was looking at flying in this morning, another devilish possibility would be, so we, we develop a, uh, an analytical tools to do, figure out what's going wrong here, but is somebody going to corrupt those systems? Can somebody come in and corrupt the tools so that we, we find problems and we, we fix it, but the fix is really worse than the disease, or, or there never was a disease there, but the tool itself. You know, maybe part of the answer to that is when you have redundant tools, you, 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 you find some problem, and somebody comes in and validates it in some way. So they just hurt me on that. So it seems to me that a big part of this is the problem of complexity. Yeah. Um, because electronic controls, allow you to add so many um, uh, additional capabilities. Yeah. All you have to do is add another subroutine, and another, right. and another. Right. And pretty soon you have a, um, a very responsive uh, whiz-bang right. uh, digital control system right. that is uh, just a, a mass of, uh, of openings for, uh, yeah. for cyber terrorists. Yeah. Whereas in the old days, when you had hydraulic control systems yeah. or pneumatic control yeah. systems, you couldn't yeah. put anything fancy in because it was just tough right. enough to, just to get the, um, uh, the the actual pistons to work. Yeah. Um, yeah. And one of the good parts about that is that you it stayed simple enough to understand. Yeah, so maybe my third cartoon to the that famous Pogo Possum one. We've met the enemy and he is us. <laughs> yes, please. So I'm still trying to understand exactly who these attackers are. I mean they must have Me too. They must have either been previous employees of the nuclear power plant that they're attacking or have like, knowledge about that plant. Yeah. Because I mean how can you attack something if you don't know the instrumentation? Well like, I'm kind of yeah. so aren't yeah. Well, a, a lot you could find on the internet, you know, but the details, you know, it's Search on the internet to know about all these attacks. Are we the FSAR? <laughs> well, yeah, there, there's certain levels of information that are not available. There are some things that, that are available. You can, have ins you can have attackers that are outsiders completely, and they can use certain things. You can have insiders being attacked. You can have insiders working with outsiders. Okay. They have uh, different levels of complexity. I just don't know how somebody outside of the power plant can attack if they don't have any knowledge of it. Yeah, well, I think you answered your own question. Okay. Yeah, you don't know, have any knowledge. I mean, you can take a, you can do a, a physical attack without much knowledge, but to do so something sophisticated, you have to have some capability. You know, some of the things they might try might be just pop up or they might just continually do, do things. Well, maybe the power plant should be more strict with who they employ in their power plant and not, like, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. It just seems right. like 
you have 14 year old kids breaking into systems that never learn what they are. So they try. That's, once they break in, then they find out what's in the system. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, they can be there in the system. No. Dr. Barry will be around most of the week. Uh, he'll be upstairs. Please visit him. Thank you again.